Welcome to the fourth lecture in Sea Alaska Heritage Institute's series entitled, We Have Lived in Southeast Since Time Immemorial. Please forgive us for the brief technical interlude we just experienced, but uh, we are back online now and ready to move forward. I am Chuck Smythe, Director of the Culture and History Department here at SHI. We have started construction of our arts campus in downtown Juneau, which will expand opportunities for education and art. If you are interested in making a donation to the arts campus, please visit sealaskaheritage.org slash campus. The title of today's lecture is Alpine Cairns and Social and Environmental Change in Southeast Alaska. As you watch the lecture, we invite you to submit questions in a chat box in YouTube. Dr. Thornton has graciously agreed to answer any questions at the end of his presentation. Thomas F. Thornton is Professor of Environment and Society and Director of the Alaska Coastal Rainforest Center at the University of Alaska Southeast. Formerly, he was Dean of the Arts and Sciences and Vice Pro Provost for Research and Sponsored Programs at the university and associate professor and senior research fellow at the Environmental Change Institute, University of Oxford in Great Britain before that. His research interests include indigenous and local knowledge systems and human environmental interactions, the political ecology of sustainable development and resource stewardship in complex socio-ecological systems and human adaptation to environmental change in the North Pacific, especially Southeast Alaska. Dr. Thornton, thank you. Thank you, Chuck. So I'm gonna do the magic of sharing screen here. Um, and let's see if that works, but it looks like. How's that? Can everybody see that now? And I've become just a small square on the side. <laughs> okay, uh, so I really appreciate the invitation to give this lecture. It's actually a project I've worked on over several years um, and uh, I'll give a little bit of background on it, but it involved a number of different partners who I'll thank here up front, including the University of Alaska Southeast, uh, the Environmental Change Institute at Oxford, where I was when I first took up my part of this study, um, University of Nebraska uh, at Lincoln, which was a, um, uh, a host uh, and the, the home of the two archeologists, uh, Ralph Hartley and Bill Hunt that I worked with um, on this report on Alpine Cairns and then the uh, Sitka tribe of Alaska uh, what played host to us uh, in Sitka. Um, and the study was uh, entitled A Pilot Project, a Multidisciplinary Exploratory Study of Alpine Cairns in Baranoff Island, Southeast Alaska. So sponsored by the National Science Foundation and uh, the uh, major investigators are listed there on the right, Bill Hunt, Ralph Hartley, Bruce McCune, Nim, Nim Nijma Ali, excuse me, uh, and myself. Um, and uh, there is your first look at an alpine cairn there. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but on the right side. And uh, part of the protocol was to um, gently um, deconstruct the cairn so that they could see how they were put together and do some dating using lichenometry um, underneath and then carefully place the stones back as they were. That was part of the protocol that was worked out with the Sitka tribe. Okay, so um, my goal today is to talk a little bit about alpine cairns, which in Tlingit are referred to as huch, uh, and they're rock piles, but also sometimes referred to as stone nests. They're found throughout Southeast Alaska and beyond and generally occur at elevations between about 1500 and 2500 feet, uh, though some are lower and, and, and I suspect a few are higher. Um, these have not been the, uh, the locus of much investigation to date. 
Uh, and that's why this pilot study was, was an opportunity to really look into them more formally. But of course, many of you know in the audience uh, about the oral histories uh, behind uh, these uh, alpine cairns, particularly at the tops of some of the higher mountains in Southeast Alaska, which are associated with uh, refuge from the great flood. Uh, one, of the, one of the early investigators who did make the connection uh, and thought it was worth looking into was Frederica de Laguna, who was a, of course, a pioneering archeologist in, in Southeast Alaska and elsewhere, and worked in Angoon in the 1940s and uh, made a point about trying to combine uh, and integrate oral history with archeology span and ethnology. And uh, she just didn't have a chance to climb the mountains and investigate some of these Alpine cairns, but she was aware of them and was, um, suggesting in that work that they deserved further attention because um, in her correspondence with geologists and other scientists, um, they said that these were not um, glacial erratics or uh, periglacial formations, but rather they were probably anthropogenic in nature uh, as the oral history suggested. So this study took place initially in 2013 and 2014. Um, and it involved uh, surveying these alpine cairn formations uh, at about the 2000 foot level, uh, north of Sitka, mainly on Baranoff Island. Uh, and between aerial surveys and ground surveys, um, the archeologists identified about a hundred of these cairns uh, and then uh, investigated uh, a subset of them. Uh, my job was to do uh, oral history and there was a kind of limited funding, but to work in at least three communities. So we worked in Angoon, Sitka, and Juneau primarily, but with uh, participants also from other communities. And then I also worked in, in archival, um, uh, in, our, in archives to uh, look at other information about such narratives. So that's the source of most of this information um, that I'll present today. So focusing on the oral history and, and also on why Alpine cairns remain important touchstones of indigenous history, adaptation and resilience. And uh, I think are of continuing relevance in this new epoch that we refer to as the Anthropocene. Okay, I seem to be not moving here. Let's try it that way. Okay, some basics about cairns. Um, where are they found? As I said, generally 2,000 feet foot level, but the range of about 1,200 to 2,500. Uh, how were they built? Uh, we don't exactly know how they were built, but they seem to involve human labor, uh, but with rocks that are sometimes fairly large, uh, too big for an average person to carry, um, or right at the kind of uh, limits of uh, what a person could carry. And so probably involved other technologies like levers to put in place. And also in the oral history, there's reference made to, to boats uh, being used uh, to move rocks around. How old are they? Well, that's, a, that's kind of an open question, but for this study, they just surveyed uh, a handful of sites uh, around, Sit uh, around Sitka, excuse me, north of Sitka on Northern Baranoff Island. And uh, they used uh, a couple of techniques. One was uh, lichenometry, which essentially looks at um, the length of time that lichen has been growing on exposed rock. The idea being that when a rock is moved and piled up, it's turned over, uh, uh, whatever growth was on it is probably uh, damaged. And so they look at new growth since that period of time and they have ways of putting dates on that. Um, because the problem with rocks is that you don't have a lot of organic material for which you can do radiocarbon dating. But if you do have that material, you can also do radiocarbon dating in and around those sites. So the dates that were, um, that were garnered from this Sitka material um, uh, were pretty shallow. So you see a date for the lichenometry there of between 258 to 892 years before present uh, and radiocarbon of 450 to 1500. So this is you know, roughly a little ice age and before uh, dates. Um, but uh, the expectation is that others that are further inland uh, or maybe for sites that are associated with older habitation 
could be older and perhaps going back to the mid or early Holocene or even late Pleistocene uh, period. Okay, um, and here's the study site. Uh, as I said, Northern Baranoff Island, a bit of uh, Chichigoff, Southeast Chichigoff as well for the aerial surveys. And uh, for mine, I, I consulted the oral history record from a much wider area because there are stories about such, such sites, such Alpine Cairn sites um, throughout Southeast Alaska and also in the interior. Um, and I wanted to show, uh, a little excerpt um, which talks about the importance of these sites. And uh, I think I want to do it uh, by de-sharing my screen here for a second and then um, resharing it and grabbing uh, this video. Uh, so bear with me. So can everybody see that? And uh, maybe I need to enlarge it. Um, okay, and I'm just gonna play a bit of this and it tells a little bit of context for the project. And uh, you hear a very nice statement from the late uh, David Katzik on why these formations are important. Look at all these rocks. And look at the sides of these rocks that are piled on top of one another. And it's interesting that if rocks didn't have any kind of meaning, what would be the purpose? Why would anybody do this type of thing? This is material, but it also shouts the spirit of a human being's endeavor to survive. It speaks louder than all the written books. This tells a story this tells a story of survival. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and then reshare. Good. So that excerpt there is uh, really nice for giving you a sense of why these are important, but also giving you a sense of what you can see from one of these Cairn sites. And uh, that video was taken by Pete Stegan, who came up from Nebraska. I think he had never been to Alaska before. And he was assigned to accompany me on uh, some of these interviews. And the one we did with, with David Katzik, I believe was the first interview, uh, followed by uh, Cyril George. and. Uh, I remember Pete's comment at the end of David's interview, which I think ran three hours with one break. Um, he said, are they all gonna be like this? <laughs> and I said, brace yourself. Uh, okay, so we're back to slides now. Hopefully everyone can see. So why did people build cairns? Uh, kind of an elemental question. Um, and though we're gonna concentrate on uh, some of the flood narratives, um, there are multiple reasons why people build cairns. Uh, certainly uh, one of them is for refuge uh, from threats, be it floods or other, others. Uh, reconnaissance is another as a kind of a lookout uh, for communication or signaling, navigation, marking, marking away, uh, for commemoration uh, of events or uh, boundaries. Storage, uh, they can be used for caching uh, things to protect them from animals uh, getting in. Uh, they can be used as cover, such as hunting blinds. Uh, you still find those 
uh, along the coast for seal hunting, but at the higher elevations, perhaps for other species like deer or even caribou in older times. Uh, for power, um, so shamanic traditions in many cultures in the Pacific Northwest have people uh, going into the mountains um, and uh, either building stacked rock features or going to uh, rocky areas uh, for meditation and to seek uh, spirits. And then obviously they can be associated with graves uh, and burials. And uh, there are also other reasons. And I, I was gonna cite boredom just because uh, several, several of the people we interviewed confessed to making uh, alpine cairns uh, during periods of boredom <laughs> on hunting trips or camping trips. Um, so lots of reasons why people put cairns together. And then the, there's the importance of stones themselves. Um, uh, stones obviously and rocks have longevity. Uh, so they're seen as very stable and uh, it's very stable markers of time. And so you find this tradition, you know, throughout the Arctic in the uh, Inixuit uh, tradition of building uh, rock figures um, to mark places. Uh, you have obviously sacred circles of stones and other places. Uh, we have a photo of Stonehenge and then down at the bottom actually is my favorite stone circle in the UK, which is called Castle Rig, uh, which is in um, the uh, Lake District National Park, now a World Heritage Site. And those were important. Uh, nobody knows the exact reasons, but they're often um, kind of convergence places where valleys and uh, trade routes and so on meet. And then partly because of their uh, association with longevity, uh, rocks, I think, are, are good symbols of, of resilience and perhaps even adaptation. Uh, and by those, by those terms, I mean them uh, in specific ways. Adaptation, when we think of it as the process of adjustment to or actual expected change and its effects, and resilience is the capacity to absorb uh, perturbations and shocks and maintain essential function and structure in a system. And then obviously um, this, the significance of rocks for sustainability and longevity is uh, obviously an important symbolic association we have uh, with stone. Okay, uh, and so a couple of the narratives that you run into, here's one from the literature from Charlie Joseph, who's a Kaguantan, uh, elder from Sitka, but uh, uh, he was quoting his own uh, ancestors here. He said, my grandfather, Shiak, would tell about Angkashlaku when the world was flooded. The white men are always telling us that we moved here from somewhere else. When did we move here? Before the flood or after? These are the questions I ask. You walk around, my good son, on top of the mountains. Your people used to live in Dachet, which is Nakwasina area. From time immemorial, your stories came from there. On the mountain, on top of there, you will see rock piles. Some of them are four feet high. Moss has grown around them. Some of the highest mountains have them in a round circle. These are the so-called stone nests. That's history. If you're Clinket, that's proof you've lived here way before time and you were created here. So that's a powerful uh, statement on what um, these Alpine cairns can mean in terms of people's sense of history and identity in a place. Um, they mark this, this longevity of time, this deep time, uh, time immemorial, if you will, and the fact that people uh, were created in this place, at least is in their modern ethnic identity. Um, and uh, I think it also uh, shows that there are different kinds of cairns. So he references here both the, the, the kind of rock piles that we saw in the initial film and video, but also these larger uh, stone nests, which are formed not as piles of rock, but, but as round circles. And I've actually uh, had the opportunity to see the one I think he's mentioning here on a trip I took with uh, Herb Hope and uh, Fred Hope and Harold Jacobs 
from Sitka when they were trying to recreate the Kiksadi survival uh, march uh, trail in 1989. And at that time, I, I didn't realize what I was looking at, but her Pope explained it to me and gave me a very similar narrative to what you, what you have here. Oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong button. Okay, so then from some of the interviews, uh, other interviews that uh, are out there in Angoon, we talked to Mabel Jack and she, uh, she said, um, and I like her phrase that these mountains saved a lot of people uh, during the flood. Uh, my father, she said, just said during the flood, he didn't say which year, but the Hood Bay Mountain where you can see it real clear that's it, like a rocket, Hood Bay old woman in Clinkett it is, that's called. From the way he talked, he said there was still a rope around the face. My father said, if it wasn't for these mountains, there wouldn't be much people here. So uh, there's a kind of reverence for these mountains and these refuge sites, these stone nests where people took refuge during the flood. Um, and then Mark Jacobs in a, in a separate interview talks about uh, a number of these mountains throughout Southeast uh, and how they are sacred from the days of the flood and the fact that you don't point at them because that can bring bad luck, bad weather and so forth, which is also documented in other, other sources. And here's a, a representation actually of the Hood Bay old woman, Sagwa Shanku. Uh, it's a tunic um, and representing the old woman who went up there and was turned to, to stone. Um, that's a Dakshawedi uh, story. Um, so one of my contentions is that these stories are conserved because they're of some relevance uh, today or ongoing relevance. Um, and this is a question that's been looked at by a few different people in anthropology and geology in the past, uh, most recently by the geologist uh, David Montgomery, who was interested in uh, the biblical flood. Uh, and so he decided to try to investigate um, the, the geologic history in relation to some of the clues that are given in the story of Noah and the great flood. And uh, he kind of agreed that you know, we should pay attention to these stories because if a story is, survives, it has to be viewed as important and it has to be viewed as continuing to have relevance or relate to something that's still visible to listeners and it must be highly memorable. And he said that stories of the Great Flood satisfy all, cri all three criteria, uh, particularly in flood prone regions. Uh, that is to say in places where flooding continues, these kinds of stories can be continue to be relevant. Um, he also suggested that they provide a framework for continuous reflection and, and social learning. That's my language though, in changing cir circumstances and, and that they continue to hold relevance um, in this era of climate change and resilience and adaptation. So what do we know, what do you know about the Great Flood? I mean, there's lots of Great Flood stories that are out there. Um, the prototypical one is the one we find in the Old Testament. Um, and I just like this cartoon because it's one explanation of what happened to the dinosaurs. Uh, and then you've had various attempts in kind of comparative religion and, and elsewhere to take that prototypical flood myth uh, the, um, that's in the Old Testament and relate other stories that you find in civilizations around the world to it. Um, and so uh, you can do that in terms of geological time, which is what the graph above uh, on the left here shows, um, going back to the, to the uh, last glacial maximum and the beginning of the Holocene, late Pleistocene Holocene transition. Uh, or you can you can look at the characteristics of the story and the, and and where you find uh, traditional stories and kind of check off those characteristics. But I think the one on the right, uh, the flood tradition that, that's comparative uh, framework there is very very much biased towards trying to find similarities only to the biblical story, and so it misses a lot of things. And one of the big things that it misses 
is the mechanism of flooding. So uh, for example, uh, if you look down the column, man's transgression and all of that, it doesn't say anything about the mechanics of the flood itself. And very importantly, in the, in the Middle Eastern version, uh, it's, it's rain that brings flooding. Whereas on the Northwest coast, it's not rain, but, but, a, but a massive tide that brings flooding. So th that would seem to be a very important difference, um, but one that's not captured here because they're taking uh, the environmental context as a kind of given. Um, the other person who's uh, looked at uh, these flood events uh, in a comparative perspective uh, in a more anthropological way is James G. Frazier in his famous book, The Golden Bough. He has a chapter um, on the Great Flood and he says that many diluvial traditions are merely exaggerated reports of flood which actually occurred, whether as the result of heavy rain, earthquake waves, or other causes. All such traditions, therefore, are partly legendary and partly mythical, so far as they preserve reminiscences, reminiscences of floods, uh, which really happened. They are legendary. So far as they describe universal deluges, which never happened, they are mythical. So that's a sort of compromise position on, uh, on these stories. But uh, many of them were doing sort of the same thing that I was trying to do in this oral history and sort of match up the, uh, the evidence. So knowing that it's very difficult to do this and uh, that maybe it's inherently flawed endeavor, uh, I'm gonna plunge into this uh, given kind of what we know and what, what are some intriguing um, some intriguing parallels in the story. So uh, I thought this would be a good topic for this lecture series in part because I knew you would have other lecturers talking about the long-term uh, development and settlement uh, of Southeast Alaska. And uh, indeed in uh, Jim Dixon's talk, you, you got a, a similar perspective on this, but so I won't spend a lot of time on it, but uh, you know, when, when were the conditions ripe for human settling uh, in the region we now know as Southeast Alaska and what, how did we get those conditions? That's obviously one question um, that relates to these longer term narratives. And then what were the disruptive forces uh, between the time of potential settlement and the contemporary era? So on the left here, you're seeing uh, some of the latest science on what we know about uh, potential migration routes. And uh, the, the arrow in the middle there between the Laurentian ice sheet and the Cordillian ice sheet uh, was kind of the old theory about the land bearing land bridge and how people crossed into the new world. Um, and then on the left is the kind of coastal route, which has gained a lot of prominence uh, with, with uh, further archeology span and uh, other evidence showing uh, that there was plenty of coastline for settlement um, as early as, uh, well, in our region about 17,000 years ago. And, uh, and so we can kind of start from there in this late Pleistocene period and think about conditions being ripe for settlement. And then of course, uh, you also heard, if you were in this lecture series, the, about the, uh, the, uh, the dating of uh, Shuka Ka, um, the uh, ancient person who, uh, who get, dates back to at least uh, 10,000 plus years old. So uh, what's happening literally on the land is, is rather complex uh, and, on, and a kind of instability during this period. And uh, so this graph on the right, which uh, comes from a, a publication that uh, Jim Bachtel shared with me, shows all of the different ways that ice is moving off of the land and obviously potentially creating localized flooding in different areas, as well as uh, the general rise in sea level, which was uh, perhaps up to 600 feet uh, in places. And then here's another, uh, photo from about 14,000 years uh, before present, which shows um, the sea level rise um, uh, and uh, again, a period of instability. Um, 
And uh, the comment here in the, in the paper that Jim shared with me is, if coastal fisher gatherers lived in Southeast Alaska by this time, rapid sea level rise accompanying the collapse of the four bulge, which uh, I think Jim Dixon also talked about this, this wave that was caused by the pushing out of the glaciers uh, towards the ocean. Uh, the collapse of the forebreds would have likely been recognizable at a human scale, meaning you would have had uh, very significant flooding uh, in, in many of the coastal areas. And then here's another way to look at it um, that shows the more complex picture in that it's not simply a sea level rise of the same uh, uh, magnitude in all areas because the land is responding differently in different areas. So the areas here um, are circumscribed in light green and then this uh, more purple color and then the blue around where Juno is. Um, and all of these areas had different responses. Uh, and so if you look at the left graph on the top here and you're going from that uh, late Pleistocene period into the early Holocene, you see that uh, the sea level rise was as high as 200 meters, so about 600 feet. Uh, and then, and that's between about 13,000 plus years ago down to about oh, 8,000 or so before you get uh, a stabilization. Um, whereas in other areas, uh, for example, out, out from the outer Alexander Archipelago, um, the elevation was actually a negative 150 uh, meters uh, before it stabilizes. So different responses in different parts of the region, which could be important. And then of course, um, when you get to the Little Ice Age after that stable, stable period uh, of the uh, early and mid Holocene, uh, when you get to the Little Ice Age, we know there are also oral histories of, of flooding that are more localized, but may have to do with glaciers that are extending and blocking uh, the passage of rivers and so forth, creating localized floods, such as on the Alsek River, for example. Okay, then turning to the oral history more formally, um, so you have this concept of sacred mountains that are associated with the great flood uh, and this period uh, of when the land flooded on Kahlaku. Um, and it's typically portrayed as a singular event, um, but we know that there are multiple types of flooding that have occurred over the time period that I've just uh, put, put parameters around from the late Pleistocene uh, up till the Little Ice Age. Um, but the most likely source of the massive del deluge is at the end of the last glacial maximum uh, or LGM. And, uh, and this fits in with the Tlingit the time scale of what, what they call shaku or stories of long ago um, uh, or in deep time, sorry. Advanced the slide by accident. Um, and this is a, a, associated with uh, a figure called the commander of the flood, who uh, is uh, the uncle of Raven in, in many versions of the story, um, and who's basically trying to kill off Raven uh, because he's uh, jealous that he might take his position. And, uh, but Raven survives, not only because he's clever and adaptive and resilient, but he's also literally born of stone. Um, so again, the reference to, to rocks and cairns as stones uh, seems to be important. Um, and then humans follow Raven or Raven teaches people how to make a living off the land after the flood um, as they uh, begin to evolve in the Holocene era. So how do we make sense of this? Um, I mean, if we took the the clinket periodization uh, of history between say mythic time, this lo long ago or deep time, uh, eternal primordial time, if you will, um, that might be this period uh, until we get to stabilization. So the end of the last glacial maximum, maybe 17, maybe 15,000 years ago till about 5,000 years ago uh, before presence. And, uh, and then after that period, you have this, this Holocene, Holocene stabilization um, that seems to be referenced 
in the Raven cycle itself with the stabilization of tides. Um, and then a second era, which I'm referring to as the epic of reorganization, which would be this kind of middle period of the development of, of Northwest Coast culture from about 5,000 years before present to about 1,500 years. And then finally, uh, an era I'm calling the epic of resilience, which is this late period of Northwest Coast cultural development from 1,500 to the present, which roughly corresponds to this uh, little ice age, which was another disruption that severely tested uh, the resilience and adaptive capacity of uh, the inhabitants of Southeast Alaska, um, but also brought other changes, including colonization, which is sometimes referred to as the flood of Western culture. And now we can think of it in terms of climate change, anthropogenic climate change. So these flood narratives remain important. So here's the first one then representing that, that first epic, uh, Raven and the Flood. So you have, this is a kind of distillation from, from De Laguna. Uh, so I'll just quote it. The first man in the world uh, was so jealous of his beautiful wife that he killed all his sister's baby boys, nephews. Uh, finally, Crane gave the grieving mother a hot stone to swallow, which resulted in the birth of an invulnerable son, Raven, that's in rock form, who grew with miraculous rapidity to manhood. The uncle had in vain tried to kill him in various ways, finally by unleashing the flood. After saving his mother from the rising waters, Raven flew to the sky and suspended himself above the flood by sticking his bill into the underside of the sky. Finally, as the flood subsided, he fell down into some floating kelp. There was nothing but water then, no land anywhere, but he met two sea otters and induced them to dive for sand at the bottom of the sea, and from this created the land. Uh, and then of course, later he steals the sun, the stars, the moon, and releases those into the sky, thus creating the modern planetary system, cosmos, what, what have you. Um, and this is a kind of a distillation of a number of different versions that De Laguna heard, uh, but it also represents ones we heard in the same area when we were doing uh, oral history. But uh, importantly, the details um, vary in different places, but the essentials of the story and the flood and the causation uh, are very similar throughout Southeast Alaska. And what's interesting to me is what happens after the flood and how that's uh, how that's uh, referenced, because uh, to the extent that people develop in this post flooding uh, environment, um, one of the most important things is they need to uh, learn to get seafood, right? And so um, you have this wonderful story of Raven climbing down the bull kelp and uh, undoing the, the tides, which were blocked by this old woman and, uh, and teaching people how to gather food. And uh, so this is a version that was uh, related to me by John Martin Sr., who's also passed away in the last year, um, a duck named Tan elder. And uh, he uh, was the keeper of this tunic, which illustrates the, uh, that uh, legend of Raven climbing down the bull kelp. And so he talks about it saying, Raven teaches us there's so much food here. Uh, why are you Hubbard starving when the table is in your backyard? So he told them that he's going to show them the way. He then proceeded to climb down the bull kelp and he told them that there was a large plug at the bottom underwater that he was going to release. And that was the tides that were uh, guarded by the old woman underneath um, or the old woman of the tides. And he started to name the different kinds of food that were under there. And uh, he spoke of the sea urchins, niece, the flounders, auntie. And he told them the different kinds of food that were not edible at certain times of the year. And he showed them the many ways to prepare food. Today, we still have the clam crest on our atu uh, raven that climbed down the bull kelp. So uh, to me, that, that story is significant because it, it is an adaptation that's going on, an adaptation to a maritime environment that uh, that has uh, tidal, significant tidal action, essentially. Um, and it may, it may be a reference to that stabilization period that's occurring. But of course, we can only speculate based on the details that we have. Um, the second era, the era of reorganization, um, 
is this kind of the second genre of flood stories that you encounter. Um, and these are uh, tend to be much more localized with specific mountains around Southeast Alaska, though not in the Sitka area. So unfortunately, this is not a, a representation of one of those. But uh, a, a very good one comes from uh, Cake area and was collected in the 1940s uh, from a man named Peter Grant uh, by Viola Garfield. And uh, uh, I like the narrative, it's fairly short, but it has some very interesting details. So he relates, my uncle Saha said the tide came only so far and then doesn't go down far. Then each time it came up, it came up higher and the people knew it and got ready to save their lives. Put things in canoes and each woman tied spruce root lengths uh, together into long rope. Um, Tides go down and canoes are dry, but each time they come up higher to the mountain, Aina Shah, right inside Port Camden. Animals tipped over some of the canoes. Bear tried to get on the canoes. Mice also came up above the tide lines. And at night, there were, mos there were like mosquitoes. Big rock still there. People tied canoes to this rock. When the water came to the mountain, it did not cover it and the people were saved. And then the water began to go down slowly. Very many people drowned. Large uprooted trees destroyed canoes and killed people. Few were saved. All were like one family during the flood. The separate tribes really started after the flood. A family reduced to one man moved off and married somewhere else and then a new tribe was started. When the tides came down, everyone came down to their places and people could not make fire or get fresh water. Small children died. Finally, the land was dry and rain gave them fresh water and the people start to live normally. After this, they started, they went, uh, they went back to all of the old places, Security Bay, Hamilton Bay, etc. cetera. Um, so, Again, there's really interesting details there about the nature of the flooding and how the tide comes up higher uh, each time, uh, how they're competing with other animals for that uh, declining space uh, as you go up the mountain, um, how it, you get this detail in other narratives. They actually built the stone nest to keep the other animals out, um, how they made rope, which features in a lot of these flood narratives. Um, to literally tie themselves uh, to the mountain. Uh, and then how devastating uh, the results were. Um, some people survived, but many, many didn't. And part of that was the debris that was sloshing around uh, after the flooding. And part of it was the lack of food and fresh water that, uh, that uh, existed after the flooding. And it also talks about people reorganizing right and so he says that there you didn't really have the separate tribes then which i think he's talking about clans um but then people remixed and uh and those developed after that time so it's a very interesting uh set of observations but obviously uh some profound adaptations also as well as resilience to be able to return uh after having been dislocated from your coastal areas um, in some cases, generations later, uh, people refinding, rediscovering those places without ever having lived there firsthand. And there are several narratives that describe those migrations to the interior and return to, uh, to the cake area uh, after several generations. Okay, so this is another interview from the oral history interviews we did uh, in 2013. So this was with Cyril George. And he talks about that migration to the interior and then the, the kind of reorganization that took place. Uh, and he's uh, talking there and he's a Kakwedi, uh, a, 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 a raven beaver clan group and uh, related to the killer whale on the e eagle side. But he says, in the meantime, in the interior, the killer whale clan saw us, the beaver clan. 
we told them we're going to salt water, meaning they're, re they're returning to the coast. We're moving to salt water. And the killer whale says, can we join you? That's where we're from. So we got down from there, the interior by canoe, and we ran into a big glacier. There's a big river going under that ice. We were stuck. Two old ladies, two old ladies from the killer whale tribe volunteered to drift under the ice on small rafts. They were strapped down. When they were pushed out, young bucks like him took off, I, I was pointing to my assistant, not to me, um, took off over the ice to see if they'll come out downstream. Uh, when they came out drifting, they were so happy. These ladies started to sing such a happy song. But the killer whale tribe, some of them didn't want to drift under the ice. They went over the hill and came down that way, uh, father-in-law says. And some from the killer whale tribe went back to the interior. Uh, we hit salt water at Wrangell and then spread out along the coast. And then he says, you know, in my old age, I've come to believe these things really happened. Our people were taught from that, uh, that from the time we were born that these things happen, we believe. Okay, and then finally, talk about the uh, epic of resilience. And um, a couple of things to point out here is uh, one, this is one of the higher uh, supposedly flood refuge mountains. Uh, it's called uh, Takunakusha. It's uh, devil's, devil's thumb in, uh, in, in English, but it's the, uh, the mountain be, be behind uh, Taku, which is uh, a bay down by Wrangell, between Wrangell and Petersburg. And uh, that is the origin of the name of the Tahuedi clan. And uh, so this was a flood refuge mountain, but we don't necessarily know how high they went up on the mountain, but we know that the mountain is commemorated as a pole and as an image by the Tahuedi. So that's an example of how the symbol is, is kind of, is, is held by a clan to reference um, their resilience over this incredible period of environmental change. And then another symbol you see, continue to see today, um, are these uh, ropes, which are often woven from, from cedar um, and worn either around the neck here, I think this is Marvin Kadek, or, or around the head. Um, and those are symbols of those ropes that, that uh, Peter Grant was referencing. Um, that people made to tie themselves to, to the mountains or to tie their rafts or boats to the mountains. And of course, those are still worn. Um, and then, in, you know, in this latter era, you have uh, this tradition of showing people uh, these sites, these Alpine Cairn sites, and teaching them why they're important. And uh, in the interviews we did, we had several references to this process. Um, uh, one of the more uh, uh, detailed ones came from the late Frank White Sr., Kaguantan. And uh, he said uh, when he was a teenager, he was taken up to one of these sites in the Chilkat Range uh, above Excursion Inlet. And he said, my grandfather wanted me to see it. You know, he says, when we're walking down the mountain, we took a risk uh, going up there. But the reason I showed it to you is to see it firsthand. Some people will ask you how long we've been here. So how long ago was the flood? We've been here. My uncles, their job was to get me ready when the time comes to lead. So that's how I learned some of my history, you know, where we came from, where we migrated from, and then after the flood. And uh, then he gave some of the details. Uh, of that story. But the thing I'm emphasizing here is that people are taken up to those places, um, even in recent times, um, partly so they do remember and they understand the significance of the history um, for their own continuance, their own survival um, as a clan, and also as maybe a model for their own leadership um, in terms of, of resilience and uh, risk. Uh, another one was uh, from uh, David Kanash, uh, he says, our grandparents used to take us up to these places um, by Thunder Bay, Thomas Bay, which is that Taku, uh, and some of, and some on Admiralty Island. And they would talk about the things that happened during the flood, 
my grandparents took us up there. They sat us down and told us a lot of the stories concerning the flood. They talked about Raven. They didn't try to moralize, so to speak. They didn't uh, say it was because of the sinful, they didn't say it was this because of the sinfulness of mankind, but they talked about being able to survive this, looking at change that was all around them and wondering, can we adapt? And adapt they did. And my grandparents sang a song about the flood. They would be up there with their shakiyat and they would leave a small offering to all those who had endured the flood and some who had died while the flood was around. They left some small gifts and would say the na their names, that is the names of the, the deceased. So there again, you have additional details and this kind of uh, notion of continuing reciprocity with this history and with these, uh, these places as sacred places. And then finally, uh, even at my own institution, we find continuing relevance uh, of flood stories. And this is a, an example from a couple of years ago, we had an indigenous people's day and uh, this design uh, was shared uh, by David Boxley um, so we could use it as part of our Indigenous Peoples Day celebration, which had the theme resilience in a time of change. And uh, uh, the fact that a, a younger artist, David Boxley, renders this image that continues to make use of the flood, which is this blue streak uh, going through the middle, um, as a symbol of, of change and, uh, and of the need for resilience uh, is is very striking and uh, and a very good representation of why this these stories have continuing relevance in uh, the contemporary era. Okay, and then finally some reflections uh, uh, in terms of why this is important to think about in relation to climate change. Uh, and if we consider indigenous peoples globally, um, studies tell us that indigenous people perhaps have the highest exposure to uh, environmental change and potential impacts of climate change, often because they've been pushed to the more marginal areas uh, already uh, on earth. And, uh, and those areas are often uh, subject to uh, vulnerabilities, instabilities, and uh, higher impacts as a result of uh, environmental change. And yet we know particularly where people have longevity in place, um, they have a uh, long tradition of resilience and, and adapt, adaptation to change. And in fact, that's really been their modus operandi. Stability has not necessarily been the pattern in places like Southeast Alaska, uh, but rather you've had, you've had change, uh, ongoing change, sometimes profound and cataclysmic, but even in times considered more stable, uh, lots of perturbations that you had to uh, adjust to. And so that is the tradition of a lot of indigenous peoples. And the narratives that go along with this change therefore can be important because they highlight the place-based knowledge and the forms of collective action that were required to respond to environmental change and stress. And so in this sense, I think that it's really worthwhile to pay attention to these narratives as critical tools for fostering resilience and adaptation thinking. Because uh, before you can maybe approach the practicalities of climate change, you have to imagine the possibilities or even uh, the, the possible impacts uh, as well as the possible responses. Um, and if you can do so, you may be in a position to engage in what the climate science community calls social learning in the face of present environmental and even social change. And what do I mean by social learning? Well, they talk about single, double, and triple loop learning, but basically single loop learning is just changes in action doing things better. Double loop learning involves more, more profound changes in one's values, assumptions, and principles in doing things. And then you get to triple loop learning and you have uh, major paradigmatic shifts in the ways that society is organized. And I think in the narrative structure I've just laid out from the late Pleistocene till at least the end of the Little Ice Age and into the contemporary era, I, I think you can see this pattern of double and triple loop learning. And I think that the narrative structures 
like the flood stories and like the stories of why alpine cairns exist, um, actually point to these processes uh, of social learning and profound reorganization. So to conclude, um, when we think more broadly about climate change, we see a process of this triple loop learning, which is represented on the top right hand there. And we have this notion of, uh, of panarchy, which uh, plays on the, on the Greek god Pan, which is a god of caprice and of disruption um, that, uh, that uh, is kind of the enemy of stability, if you will. And uh, he's a lot like Raven in that sense, being a disruptive uh, innovator. And so panarchy is a way of understanding how you need to continuously adapt uh, to change. And I think we find that in the, in the traditions uh, associated with Alpine Cairns and these flood narrative uh, uh, stories. And resilience theory suggests that no system can be understood on a single scale. And by that means you, you, need, to, you need to be able to look across larger time scales and multiple spatial scales to understand the problems you face uh, when you're dealing with large scale problems like climate change. And I think again, the Alpine Cairn stories and the wisdom they hold really speak to this fact of, of learning to think at least cognitively grasp social and temporal and spatial scales in multiple ways um, and how to respond to them. And then obviously there are touchstones of, of deep time, you know, your, your, your earliest origins, where you were, where you were created, as Charlie Joseph said, and also for contemporary environmental and social change, including the flood of Western culture. And so I think these, these narratives are, are good to think because they're, they relate to us really a lot of what we need to be thinking about when we think about adaptation, resilience, survival, social learning, and the like. And with that, I will conclude and say thank you very much. Well, good next to you, Dr. Thornton. Uh, thank you very much for telling us about these cairns, these ancient structures and their connection to today and how Thinget continue to think and reflect and uh, benefit from this history in the present. Um, it's very, very interesting. Um, we do have a few questions and comments and I'd be happy to relate them to you. Um, one was, uh, did you find any cultural materials under the Cairns? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, they didn't find anything particularly old um, and not much in general. But uh, the complete inventory of what they found and the dates are in this publication that I referenced, um, and maybe I'll hold it up. But if you Google Maritime Alpine Cairns, um, maybe that doesn't show up. <laughs> it's not showing up well. <laughs> but, or if you, if, you, if you Google Alpine Cairns and uh, University of Nebraska, you can get access to the online report. And, uh, and it does talk about what material remains they found, but, but they, they didn't find that much actually and in, in the ones in the Sitka area. And what they found was, was relatively recent. Um, but again, uh, one of the points I'm making is that that shouldn't be the end of the story because from what we know about that area, it, it perhaps wouldn't be the right place to look for, for the oldest uh, types of material because of its geologic history. Yeah. Well, one of the comments is that uh, we adopted the song of the two old ladies going under the ice that they were singing when they went under the ice as a land claim song in the late 1960s. Okay. I think I'd heard that, but I don't know any of the details. Is, is there, <laughs> when, when we say we, is it, is it, uh, a group? Well, the Southeast people did when they okay. were yeah. when they were advocating for land claims and uh, yeah. Yeah, I would like to know more about that. But again, that's very much in the spirit of these touchstones and why why they're of continuing relevance. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know? yeah. So, yeah, and that, that story I, uh, relating to that Stikine River is so interesting and uh, I think is worthy of some more investigation in terms of the dynamics of deglaciation and glaciation on the Stikine River watershed. Yeah, that is an interesting story. Um, another comment is uh, this lady writes, when researching my book about the Stikine River, I learned about the Cairns and I'm so glad to learn more. I saw a photo of one up the Stikine taken by a helicopter pilot. Oh, uh-huh. I'd be very interested in seeing that too. Wonder if it's if it's Devil's Thumb, which I showed there, or uh, or one of the other mountains. There's several yeah. that are, that are referenced. And again, if you if you look for this report um, from University of Nebraska, there's a table in the back that that has uh, a number of the mountains that are referenced in the literature. Yeah, yeah there was uh, a Duck Low AD man sent me a photo of. of the old lady of Zagwa, who, mm. who was turned to stone when she went up the top of that mountain in the back of Hood Bay. And there's a stone formation there that's yeah. very evident, very clear from the photo you see on the top, very top of the mountain. Mm -hmm. So uh, these, these material representations of, of, of these events or the beliefs are, are very, uh, very much part of, of clan history and traditions today, as you pointed out. Yeah, and I think uh, there's a one notion that everybody who survived the initial flood, the great flood, was turned to stone, uh, either because of the events or, or by Raven. And, and if you read in Swanton, uh, you know, the early ethnographer, John Swanton, he talks about, you know, people used to be made of stone and now they're made of leaf, right? Um, and, uh, and, and the people before the flood who turned to stone are of course immortal. And that's one of the, one of the, one of the powers of uh, turning to stone, I guess, but, but maybe at another level, they're not as flexible, <laughs> not as adaptive. Uh, they stay where they are. Um, but that's, uh, that's a very interesting, uh, I guess you would say, change in the nature of, uh, of people after the flood, right? They're, they're made from leaf and not from stone. It is interesting. Well, thank you again for a very uh, learned lecture and discussion. Um, SHI invites viewers to return for our next lecture by Dr. Jeff Lear entitled Overview of the Dene Languages and the Place of Thinget in Nandane, which will be broadcast on Thursday, this coming Thursday at noon. We have a link below the YouTube video for a survey we hope you will take a moment to complete. This will help us to continue improving our lecture series and also allow our funders to measure the impact of the program. SHI has started construction of our arts campus in downtown Juneau which will expand opportunities for education and art. If you are interested in making a donation to the arts campus, please visit sealaskaheritage.org slash campus. Thank you and see you on Thursday. Thanks again. Good cheese.